Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Virginia Alternate Assessment Program Module 2 webinar. Um, my name is Shelley Lovingrider. I'm one of the assistant superintendents at the Virginia Department of Education, working primarily with assessment and accountability. This evening, I'm joined by a number of colleagues from the student assessment staff and also the special education services staff. Some of them will be presenting tonight and others will be monitoring the Q&A feature and answering questions as we move throughout the presentation. As Leah noted, um, please do put your questions in the Q&A feature. Uh, we will not be monitoring the chat. Um, this uh, presentation is going to be recorded, uh, so you will have access to it at a later time. We do have quite a bit of information to cover tonight, um, so we will move through the presentations fairly quickly. Um, we know there is a great deal of interest in the new VAP. Um, it is very different from the previous version of VAP. We've moved from a portfolio-based assessment where you were choosing the ASOL that you were going to use for your student's portfolio uh, to a multiple choice assessment where uh, any, any of the Virginia essentialized standards of learning are eligible for assessment. So we know that it's a very um, different type of assessment. And we also know that there's a great deal of interest in what the test will look like. And so really that is the focus of uh, tonight's uh, webinar. So Lee, if you'll go to the next slide. One thing that really hasn't changed as we've moved from <clears throat> VAP 1.0 to the new VAP is um, the coordination or the connection between the academic standards, uh, which are now the VSOLs, assessment and instruction. It's important that all of these fit together to ensure that our students uh, have appropriate instruction and are successful on uh, their assessments. Next slide, Liam. We have already provided quite a bit of training on VAP. We knew that uh, the assessment was going to be really different. And so we began providing training actually last May. That was an introductory training. And the idea there was to provide an overview of what the old VAP looked like, talk about the new VAP, to introduce the concept of the Virginia Essentialized Standards of Learning. For those of you who haven't been with us before, the VSOLs, as we call them, are based on the standards of learning, but we followed a process of essentializing them to uh, create standards that are appropriate and accessible for students with significant cognitive disabilities. And in that introductory webinar last May, we also talked just briefly about the, the test design. Moving on, we had module one in August of this year. Here, the focus really was on the characteristics that of students with significant cognitive disabilities, looking at the new VSOLs in reading, math, and science, and also quite a bit of discussion of the curricular resources that uh, the TTACs in particular have provided um, to support the instruction of those VSOLs. And each a recording of each of the webinars is available on the VAP uh, page on the DOE web, web page, website if you are not able to, to join us for those presentations. We are going to be having additional training. Uh, of course, tonight is module two. Um, uh, this is the second of the webinars of module two. And as I said earlier, this module really focuses on the, the test itself. Um, we'll be looking very extensively at what the items look like. Um, we'll also look at supports that are provided to the students uh, within the test items. We'll be looking at the test nav supports and tools. And test nav is the, is the, um, the software that's used to uh, provide uh, online access to, to the test items. So uh, we'll talk about this more later, but the that uh, items are available in a, both a paper presentation and also online. So uh, for those students who are accessing the items via computer or uh, tablet, they will be viewing the, the items through, um, through test now. We'll also talk quite a bit about VAP test conditions. Um, uh, these are 
conditions that often are, would be considered accommodations in a different testing program, but we are providing them to, to all students um, for VAP. And we'll also talk about accommodations. Finally, we'll talk about three students who might be, be participating in VAP and what their participation might look like. And lastly, we'll talk about what the VAP test itself will look like at the very end. I know many of you have questions about what the overall test will look like. So we'll focus on that as well. And then the last module in this series will be module three. Um, it will occur um, later in the fall and it will um, focus uh, on test administration, um, uh, the security requirements uh, and the technical requirements required for uh, providing the, the test in an online environment. Next slide, Leah. So this is uh, just a screenshot of our web page. So if you are interested in uh, finding resources uh, for VAP, whether it be the recorded webinars we've done previously or other resources, this is how you find it. On the left-hand side, go to the home page and then click on the right-hand side for VAP. And that's where you'll see all of the resources we're talking about tonight. And then we'll talk a bit, here's the WAP a module two that webinar schedule. As I said, uh, tonight is the second in the series and there will be three more presentations of this particular module. So if you are interested, um, you can certainly view the rest of these. Um, uh, we appreciate you all being with us late at night tonight, but the remainder of these are during the day. All right, Leah, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in this module. We really are trying to provide you with some information about the flexibility that the new VAP provides. We all are aware that um, the population of students who will participate in VAP uh, it is quite varied. And so they're, they're going to need um, uh, lots of supports, uh, including testing conditions and also accommodations. And as I mentioned earlier, we will talk about the test items extensively and then a bit of discussion about the, the test itself. And uh, essentially the five important questions will be addressed and those are on the next slide. So we'll look at some items, talk about how they are structured, um, what supports are provided within those items. We'll talk about TestNav, as I said earlier, that's the software that's used to uh, uh, present the items online. And it does include some accessibility supports that will be useful to students. We'll talk about testing conditions. Again, these are um, supports that we often would think of as accommodations in uh, other assessment programs, but in order to be as flexible as possible, we are providing access to those supports for all, all, all students who are participating in VAP. And then finally, there are some individual accommodations that are available, um, and we'll talk about uh, how those will be accessed. Next slide. Uh, we talked about this already, but please do use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Um, well, we will have DOE staff monitoring the questions and in many cases they will provide an answer directly to you. Um, we will have a time at the end to uh, see if there are questions uh, we can address for the entire group. But as I mentioned earlier, we do have a lot to cover and there may not be a great deal of time to, to cover questions at the end. So. You do have questions, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A feature and probably someone on the uh, DOE staff will be able to respond directly to you. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and we will post it uh, on the DOE website on that VAP page once all of the presentations are completed. So since this is only the, the second webinar, um, uh, the recording will not be available uh, for some time yet. And then we've had some questions about certificates of participation because um, we do have such a large number of uh, people attending these webinars, we're not going to be able to provide certificates of participation. All right, All right so let's talk a bit about the actual VAP 
test items. So we're gonna talk about what the items will look like and then what supports are available to students as they interact with those items. So let's look at a few items. So we're gonna start with a reading item, but the structure of the VAP items is similar regardless of content. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see really the, the template for each of the items. There's an item set up. And so this is a uh, text that is either read to the student by the uh, computer or by a human reader, the test examiner. And it really provides information, uh, introductory text about the item and directs the student's attention to the item. Next, there's a presentation of the test item and then the answer options. So if we were administering this item, this is sort of how it would go. Here is a sentence about Ben. Ben likes to bake bread. What does Ben like to bake? Apple oven bread. And the examiner can point to those options as he or she reads them. You'll notice that there is just one item presented to the student at a time. So if the student is accessing the item online, the student would see just this item on the screen. Or if the student is accessing the item via paper, there would just be this item presented. You'll notice there's lots of white space. Um, the text, the language that's used um, is fairly simple. And in this particular example, the, the words are accompanied by pictures, and that is, is often the, the case with these items. So that's what a reading item looks like. Let's go on to a math item. Again, similar structure. There's the item set up. Here is an addition problem. What is one plus four? The test item itself, one plus four equals and then the options, one, three, five. So similar structure, structure regardless of content. And then lastly, we'll look at a science item. Okay, so here is a plant in the sun. Photosynthesis is how plants use light to make food and grow. What give, gives light to plants? Leaves, sun, clouds. Again, the answer options are accompanied by, by pictures. So that gives you an idea of what the items look like and how the students will interact with them. As you can see, there's a quite a bit of support provided within the item. For the most part, the items are read to the student. Um, again, one item per screen or page. And for the most part, or in many cases, the options are accompanied by pictures. All right, Leah, next slide. So just to summarize how we are hoping students will interact with the VAP items. So we really have designed the test to provide maximum flexibility for students to independently show what they have learned about the content while maintaining test security. So we want to make sure that the student is doing his or her, her own work and that we're main, maintaining the security of the items, but there is a great deal of flexibility provided to allow students uh, of many different uh, uh, learning styles to access the items. For the most part, uh, we think that the Tests will be administered individually to students. There may be some exceptions, but um, uh, the test is certainly set up so that it's available for an individual administration. Could be administered over multiple days. Um, we know um, many students who will be taking VAP uh, may get tired after a few items. So it's possible for students to just do a few items uh, and then uh, resume the test the following day. As I noted earlier, the students can access the items either on the screen, on a laptop, on a computer, 
or they can have um, a paper presentation of the item, either is available to students. And in some cases, um, uh, the, the student may need both presentations and that would be allowable. As I mentioned earlier, the items for the most part are read to the students. Um, there's a text to speech functionality within the online presentation or the examiner can read the items to the student much as I did with you as we went through the sample items. And then we'll talk more about response options later on, but um, students can either choose the answer online or indicate the response to the examiner through whatever communications means they normally use. And then the, the examiner can record that answer for them. All right, Leah, next slide. All right, so we're now going to talk a bit about the test nav supports and tools. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, there is an option for the student to view the items through the online test nav software. And uh, Kevin McClintock with the assessment staff is now going to talk a bit about what test nav is and all of the tools that are available uh, to students. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin, you're on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Shelly. Sure. Um, as Shelly mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, test now and, and the supports that are available under that. We'll, we'll answer the question, what is test now? Um, and, and then we'll uh, show you some of the supports and tools um, that are available in the online format, as well as uh, what are available for examiners and possibly students to practice using test nav or even to see what the paper format looks like. Next slide. All right, so what, what is test nav? Uh, some of you that are uh, familiar with SOL testing, as well as this fall, we have the growth assessment. Um, all of that is administered, any online test are administered through test nav. It's the online application. Uh, and it is provided and managed by Pearson, who was our contractor. And some of the things we're going to talk about in test nav, and these are available to uh, any student taking the VAP, uh, taking it online, is the text to speech uh, feature. And we'll talk about the settings in the toolbar. Uh, and then there's the Keller contrast, which is uh, available to all students, as well as the magnifier, which is uh, available to magnify just. Uh, portions of the page and then zoom in and zoom out, which uh, will be available to magnify the entire page um, all at one time. Next, yep. Uh, so this is a sample of what TESNAV looks like with an item on the screen, and this is a VAP item. In the upper left corner, you'll see there's the, the blue buttons. There's a forward and backwards button. Um, students and examiners would be able to um, go back uh, to an item. Now, again, they go back to an item um, in, in that setting. Once a student would leave the setting, they really shouldn't be going back uh, to items they completed on a previous day. Um, but the forward and backward buttons will be available. Um, it, it, the question shows uh, Ty, who likes to do things with his father. father. Um, and then what is another word for the father? And then there's the three answer choices. Uh, it's a radio button. You would select the answer by clicking uh, either the circle in front of the answers or on the answer. Then the upper right corner is the user drop down menu. And we'll focus on uh, in a little bit here on what's available under that. Again, this is for all students. And then we'll also talk a little bit de of detail about the text to speech uh, controls um, and, and what each one does. Next slide. All right, the, uh, what is an examiner's role uh, when a student is, is taking the online test and, and what can they do? Um, so if a student is testing online uh, using uh, TestNav, the examiners can interact um, with the features um, depending on the student's needs or to make um, the testing experience um, what's best for that student. 
uh, the examiners, uh, if they're going to do this, will definitely need practice with use. They need to know what features are available, um, also how to implement them, um, and what would be best for each student. Uh, we are going to provide some training. There'll be uh, some training available for examiners as well as students um, in which they can actually practice and uh, see what the uh, items look like, how to answer them, um, what tools are available, uh, what supports are available. And then we will have that there will be training for the examiners, which will be separate. And those practice items are separate from uh, what is being uh, prepared for the student. There will be uh, tests available or uh, practice items available for uh, the various grade levels and content areas. And those will be available for the students um, coming a little bit later this fall. All right, let's talk first about the uh, text to speech toolbar. And again, this is available for all students uh, who are taking the uh, VAP assessment. Um, the examiner can, can push these buttons. The student could push these buttons. The controls are gonna be um, on the right screen, on the right and kind of towards the middle. And, the, and that's, um, and it, that's an ex a sample of what it looks like and that'll be on the right side. You've got the play button. Uh, at the top, once you hit play, it becomes the stop button. Uh, then you have the megaphone button, which is the click to hear. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what each one of these does in the next couple slides. And then there is the jump back or rewind button, uh, jump forward, and uh, same as fast forward. And then there's settings, which a few things can be controlled on there um, for the students' needs. And we'll discuss those in just a second. All right, the play button. Uh, what happens when the student clicks on the play button or the examiner clicks on the play button? It reads the entire, um, it reads the questions, it reads the, uh, the answer choices, and it starts from beginning and goes to the end. Um, as it reads, each sentence is highlighted or portion of the items uh, is highlighted in yellow. And then you'll see that the tie is highlighted and as it reads each word, uh, it would be highlighted in blue. Uh, and then the stop button appears uh, if you need to stop it. If you hit play again, it will start all over again from the beginning. So that's why the megaphone feature um, is available. That's on the next slide. Um, which is the click to hear tool. Uh, again, that little megaphone on the right, that allows uh, the student or examiner to select just a portion of the, the item. They can, in this case, the second sentence is selected. Uh, when you click, it will start at what. Um, you could also select it an answer choice. If you wanted to hear just be read over again, you could select that and just uh, highlight that and it would read dad. Right, next. All right, the user drop down menu. Again, these are available for all students. It's in the upper right hand corner. Uh, there's three uh, things, actually four things you can do on there. Um, you can change the background color, which we will talk about here in a little bit. Um, there is the magnifier tool, and we'll discuss that a little bit, and then zoom. Uh, right now, you can see this was set to 100%, which is normal. That's the default. And then this is also where um, the examiner or student would sign out of TestNav if they were done for the day or if they were done, but they were going to come back to this test. Uh, this is where you would sign out of test nav um, and it, the test could be restarted from that point. Next. All right, the background and foreground colors. Again, these can be selected. Um, if this is changed, it is uh, note that it is changed for every item from then on. Um, it would be changed unless it's changed back. The default is white on black. Um, so every, every student's test is uh, it starts off that way. And again, the contrast can be changed to any of those choices. Uh, and one thing to note that the artwork, uh, if there are pictures on that, that does not change based on the color settings. It's really just the um, background. If they were text, it would change all of that. Um, but again, uh, to change that, uh, you can change that on any item at any time and it will be, it will stay um, whatever you choose until changed again. Next. The uh, magnifier, um, when it's enabled, 
Uh, it's a little square box that can be moved around the screen. This is if only a portion of the screen um, you would want to magnify or the student would want to magnify. Um, you can see that this, this is the, uh, an actual screenshot. Uh, shows how much the A is versus B or even the sentence, what is the, um, and you would keep scrolling to the right, it would say the area of this figure. Uh, but you can see how much it would magnify. Again, that can be moved around anywhere on the screen, over the artwork, um, on any portion of the screen to uh, magnify it if a student would need that. Now, Zoom, um, by changing the Zoom setting, that changes the entire screen, that magnifies the entire screen, not just a portion of it. Um, there, there is some caution in this. If it's zoomed in too much, there's going to be a lot of scrolling. Um, so it really should, um, this should all be tested prior to testing to see what uh, Zoom would be best for the student, um, as well as it's all relative to the size of the screen as well. Uh, zooming on a small screen uh, would, would require a lot more scrolling than if there was a larger monitor, um, the, the scrolling on that. And there are other ways to, you can do it up through the uh, user dropdown menu is one place to change it. But there are other shortcuts, and, and we'll, we'll talk about those in later trainings and things like that. But if it's a touchscreen device, it can be pinched and zoomed in and out. Um, and then there are keyboard shortcuts if they're using a laptop or a desktop. Next screen. All right, uh, let's talk about, we, we mentioned there are some things available for examiners to see what these things look like and see how TestNav works. Um, we created 10 sample items. Um, and they're available both in paper and online presentation. Um, and they cover all the content, well, various content areas uh, and grade levels. And that's available on the VAP. Um, that link will take you to it. Uh, on the DOE page, we have a link to the VAP webpage. Uh, and there's a link for these sample items. We'll show you where that, what that looks like here in the next couple slides. But these sample items um, are, are really only for um, educators, parents, these really aren't for students. Uh, and the reason for that being is they are a mixture of different content areas and grade levels. It's really to, to let everybody have an intro to see, this is really for the adults, um, to see what the test looks like, uh, what test nav looks like, um, what the paper version looks like. Um, again, the, these are not, and I'll say it probably a couple more times, you don't want to use these with students because they are uh, a mixture and they're really only for um, adults to kind of get a feel for what this test is going to look like. Um, we will have practice items available soon, as I mentioned earlier this fall for students, but these are really for adults. All right, next. All right, here's that uh, web page. Uh, when you go to the, um, the VAP page, it'll have links for the VAP sample items. You can download a PDF um, or open a PDF of the paper copy. And then there's the online, which will take you to an online version of TestNav, where you can see what these items look like um, in TestNav. And you can uh, get to experience all the uh, supports that are available. Uh, when you download the paper copy or open the paper copy, it includes the examiner's copy um, and script. And then the student, um, what it would look like if a student had, now again, don't use these with the student. These are really just for the examiner um, and the adults to see what this test would look like. Uh, for the online presentation, uh, same thing. There's the paper uh, or the uh, examiner's copy in a PDF form. And then there's a link where you can go to um, see what the accompanying online test would look like. Uh, and as I saw this question come up quite a bit, uh, in the chat already. Um, again, the paper test and the online test are available to all students. Um, students can have access to one or the other or even both that have a paper copy while they're taking the online version. Next. All right, let's look at some of these uh, sample items, what they look like. The exam, this is the paper presentation or paper version. Uh, that PDF contains, and you can see on the left, this is what the examiner's copy would look like. And each page would have um, maybe two, three, maybe four items, um, however many will fit on a page. Um, and the examiner's copy, again, is scrunched a little bit. Uh, the student copy will have one item per page. 
and they'll always be in landscape um, to format uh, and landscape orientation. Uh, so you can see how the item on the left, the, it contains a little extra script. That's what the examiner would be reading to the students. Um, they would read here are three words and they would point to each. Uh, the directions are there in parentheses. Then they would read the, uh, the question and then the answer choices. And then on the right, that would, um, the student would see the question uh, and as well as the answer choices. Now the online presentation, when you click on that link, it takes you to an online version of TestNav. If you click the link, uh, when you click on, that's when you click on the sample items. The link below it is to the PDF of the examiner's copy. Uh, again, you can see that same item. It's the same as paper. Uh, it contains the examiner script and, and the examiner will need this regardless of whether the student has taken the test um, online or uh, in paper, they would need this script that would be the same script and it contains everything they need to read. Um, it, as you see on the right, this is how you would access those. Um, again, this is, this is not for students. Um, this is the sample items for examiners to go look at these practice items. Um, you would go to that link and all the way on the right, all those other mathematics, reading, writing, science, those are SOL sample items. You don't want to click on those if you're looking for VAP. VAP's all the way on the right. So you would click on that VAP tab, uh, and then that would bring up those 10 sample sets or those 10 sample items. Next. And again, the last reminder um, that that examiner script, this is the, the, the uh, cover that looks like those 10 items. Um, again, those, those are for uh, sample only for adults for you to get a uh, feel of what they look like and, and what the actual administration will look like. Please don't use these with students. There will be items uh, later this fall available for that purpose. All right. I think that's it. Unless there's something, I'll turn it over to, I'm not sure who's next. Is that Leah? It is Kevin. It is I. Right. Thanks, Leah. Thank you, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Leah Mason. I am going to spend some time with you all to talk about uh, VAP testing conditions as well as um, individual accommodations. And um, as you all have heard earlier in the presentation, our um, Assistant Superintendent Shelley Levin Ryder. Uh, shared with you that it is our effort to um, really provide the maximum amount of flexibility um, for students participating in this new VAP assessment. And so as she went through the uh, structure of the items, you could see that there was already some supports within the items in terms of pictorial support for some of the answer options. And then my other colleague, Kevin Clintock, went through test nav to kind of give you some additional embedded supports that are embedded in test now for um, students participating in this uh, new VAP assessment. And so I'm going to um, go through the um, testing conditions um, first. And I'm gonna define for you what those testing conditions are, um, give you examples of what they are, and then um, also share how those testing conditions can support those students that are eligible to um, participate um, in the VAP, in the VAP assessment. So what are testing conditions? We define them as conditions that, again, here we go, we wanna provide as much flexibility as we possibly can to the uh, testing environment to ensure that these students in this population can access the new uh, VAP assessment. These uh, testing conditions that we're calling VAP testing conditions are available for the new VAP test for all students that are eligible to participate in the VAP. Now the testing conditions are not gonna be considered accommodations and they are not required to be documented in the student's IEP. Now, as I go through some of these testing conditions, those of you that are familiar with the um, allowable testing accommodations um, that you see in the SOL test implementation manual, 
you will see um, a lot of those are now moving over into a different capacity for VAP, for the new VAP assessment. And so because they are moving into a new capacity of in the VAP assessment, they still hold the same conditions and policies for the students with disabilities on the SOL side, but you will see some similarities of some of those um, conditions um, in a new capacity for the VAP side. And so you will see that they are grouped in four, four categories, um, familiar to you are timing and scheduling, setting, presentation, and response. So for timing and scheduling, we're looking at multiple test sessions, which students may have um, test over a number of days. Um, the time of day, which will determine the most appropriate time of day for the student to test. Um, the order of test, what is gonna be the most appropriate order um, in terms of reading mathematics and science that the student should um, be administered their test and plan breaks as necessary. For setting conditions, um, ensuring that the student is being tested in the best location with the least amount of distractions, whatever um, special furniture if they need or any adaptive furniture is available to them as a condition, special lighting, and for the most part, as has already been shared, um, that these students will be tested in a one-to-one -one individual uh, setting. So presentation accommodations. For presentation accommodations, you see the list here on your screen. Conditions, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say accommodations. They are conditions, because there is a difference. The presentation conditions are going to be conditions in which that's going to change the way information is really presented um, to the student. And so we have manipulatives, calculators, and verbal prompts. And you see an asterisk beside those because I'm going to talk about those in a little bit more detail. But um, the use of visual aids, if students need highlighters or color overlays, magnification, um, any type of auditory amplification, uh, visual point to support. Um, Kevin talked about um, in the sample items, and you all will start to see this as you get into these items, that even what's embedded in the um, introductory statement, if you all notice where he said, here are three words, there's information that says point to each item. And so there are some supports there, even within the items to help you all with directions and questions and answer options. And then you also have the condition of allowing the student to read aloud themselves and sub vocalization. Manipulatives. Um, Manipulatives are often used in the instructional part for um, this population. We use a lot of manipulatives to kind of help bring a lot of the abstract concepts taught to give it some concrete material um, for these students. And so we are definitely wanting for you all to be able to use manipulatives to help these students with their instruction, but also in their testing environment. But there's some conditions around the use of manipulatives that we want to make sure that you all um, are aware of. And so two things that we want to ensure that they should not be doing is that we don't want you to use manipulatives to you know, provide the answers directly to the students. And we don't want manipulatives to be used in the way in which they're going to identify or help them determine the process in which um, a particular task or concept should be answered. Um, we also don't want to um, allow for manipulatives to be coached for students in terms of helping them to decide which manipulatives they should use during testing. But you do want to use manipulatives that are familiar to the student and use during instruction. Um, we want to ensure that those manipulatives are used individually and students are not sharing them during the time of their uh, test administration. They want to make sure that they are available at the time the student is accessing their test for them to be able to choose. And also, you want to make sure that the manipulatives are blank. They should not be labeled. Um, and the example we have here, you know, refractions and decimals, some of those manipulatives can often be labeled. So please make sure that whatever manipulatives you have for the students to access during their test administration, that they are blank. 
the calculator, that's been a popular question in terms of can students in this population have access to a calculator? And the answer is absolutely yes, they can. Um, they can have use a handheld calculator that they are most familiar with. Uh, hopefully something they used in the classroom during regular classroom instruction. Uh, for those students who use um, assistive technology, if they need talking calculators or braille calculators, that is allowable. And you all do not have to complete the calculator accommodation criteria form for the students to have access to the calculator during their, uh, VAP, during their VAP test. So yes, the calculator is allowed and it's expected that they're using the calculator that they're most familiar with and they've used with instruction. Visual, verbal and visual prompts. Um, we know that with this population, there probably tends to be a lot of prompting. And so we want to um, give you all some guidance here in terms of um, how verbal prompts and how visual prompts can be used during a testing session for students participating in the new VAP. They, these are also gonna be um, considered um, testing conditions. They're gonna be available to all of the students that are participating in, in um, the VAT. But we just want you to definitely make sure that the types of prompts that you are going to use for these students, that these prompts do not clue or prompt the student to the answer to provide an unfair advantage. We've actually broken these prompts out into four categories for you to consider when you're thinking about the types of prompts that will be needed to meet your students' needs. The first category, and all of the categories in the slide are listed, I mean, are reflected in bold. So the first one is that you're looking at prompts that focus the student and, brings, and bring the attention to the test. And so we have an example here of a student that, they say, Sue, listen as I read this sentence. And then the examiner points to a picture or a symbol that's used in the classroom. And this is basically to help bring focus. So you wanna use um, verbal or visual prompts that are gonna help the student focus and bring their attention to the test. You wanna look at prompts that are gonna cue the student to respond. Sometimes we have to provide a little extra motivation to get the students to respond to their um, test items. And so the example here is that Tim points, Tim, point to the number that, show, that shows what six plus eight equals. And so then the examiner will point to choice cards to help the student along to respond to their test item. The third category is asking about the need for a break. Um, sometimes we can recognize when our students need a break and fatigue is setting in. So the example shown here is asking Jessica, do you need a break or a snack? And sometimes you may have a break card and your examiner can point to the break card to indicate whether or not the student is ready for a break. And then motivating the student to continue. That's a big one. Um, we know also we have to provide them with a lot of encouragement and motivation to continue. And so your prompts that you wanna use should be fitting into the category of mo motivating the student to continue and move forward. The example that we have here is Carl, let's do one more and then you'll get a star on your behavior chart, whatever your motivation that you're using within your classroom. Um, here, the examiner points to a symbol to keep working. So verbal prompts and visual prompts are acceptable testing conditions for the students to use during their test administration of VAP, but just please try to make sure that whatever you're using falls in within these four categories to either bring the attention back to the test, to help them focus, to help them um, focus and cue to respond, to determine whether or not um, it's time for a break or whether or not they just need some more motivation, encouragement, and just a little bit of a push to continue um, moving through the test. Response conditions. So we have a few response conditions. These are you know, conditions that kind of help the students um, complete what they're doing. Um, we have a list here of intentional regulation and self-regulation um, sensory supports, physical position supports, um, examiner records responses. That may be one that's familiar with you all, especially if you 
um, have any uh, familiarity with how that works on the SOL side, but it goes back to a point that Shelly made earlier about how the student would respond in terms of their communication uh, mode. The students may have to respond verbally. They may point or, you know, otherwise how they're going to indicate their response through whatever their communication mo modality would be. Um, assistive technology, alternate response modes, and response aids for paper versions such as adaptive pencils or key guards. Those are response conditions for, um, for VAP participants. So most of you are very much aware of assistive technology. You probably use quite a bit of assistive technology within your classrooms. And so um, we're going to we're definitely looking at AT as being a condition as well. Um, and that is just any any device that they're using as serving as their primary mode of communication. Um, it could be any piece of equipment, any type of product system, anything that is acquired commercially from the shelf. What have you um, to improve their to improve their capabilities based on their um, disability? So, all of the conditions, as I shared before, are not required to be documented in the student's IEP. There's going to be more information about these testing conditions and more guidance about the test con testing conditions provided in the VAP uh, test implementation manual. So you, once that is able to come out, and it's not out now, it's coming, but it's not out now, um, you will be able to uh, refer to that document in order to get additional information in terms of the conditions and how those conditions should be administered um, in a VAP testing session. So now I just want to take um, a few minutes to talk about VAP individual uh, test accommodations and just to talk about what those individual accommodations are and how they are to uh, be documented. So as we all know, um, individual test accommodations um, provide these students with access to the new VAP test to help them demonstrate what they know. Um, we all know that uh, test accommodations are changes in the administration of the assessment. Um, they can result in how adjustments are made to how the test can be presented, even of how the student responds. Um, it is our hope that when the appropriate accommodations are selected and used correctly, that you can see some reduction in the effects of the student's disability, but at the same time, we're not trying to provide the student with an unfair advantage. Now, the individual test accommodations that I'm gonna share with you, those accommodations must be documented in the student's IEP. So what I'm gonna share with you as I move through the next slide, these are expected to be documented in the IEP where the VAT testing conditions that I just shared prior to this, they are not expected to be documented in the uh, student's IEP. So the test, individual test accommodations, we also wanna to continue to maintain the integrity of the assessment. We wanna make sure that we are not providing the students with an unfair advantage by leading them or providing them with an answer. Um, these are, should be accommodations that the students are familiar with um, and they use routinely in instruction. It should best reflect their learning styles and it also should allow these students to respond appropriately in the best mode for those students. So the good news, you only have four. You only have four individual test accommodations. Braille, for those students that are in need or will be you know, in this population that use Braille, interpreting and transliteration, read aloud, and I'm gonna spend a little time on read aloud, and then also alternate representation of response options. There's an asterisk beside that too, because I'm gonna talk about that a little bit as well. So. These are the four that need to be, appear in the student's IEP for participation in the VAP if they are needed to meet the needs for the student based on their disability. So let's talk about read aloud. For the read aloud accommodation, majority of the items are already going to be read to students. And if they're either going to be read to them either through text to speech if they're participating in the online or if they're using the paper version, they're gonna use a human read aloud, or even if they're on the online test, they still could have an examiner uh, read aloud. Um, 
items to them, but there is a very small number of items that are not read to students. And so the read aloud accommodation that's gonna to apply to that small number of items, which you can see mostly is gonna be in reading once you get to those items, they are not read to all students. And where you will find this is that in that introductory text statement, when uh, Shelly was sharing about the um, structure of the test items, that introductory text that's read to the student is gonna be information there that's gonna to specify to the student or the examiner that the student is to read all or part of the item. And so that a read aloud accommodation is gonna provide that additional support for those students who have that, who have that, who, who students whose disability impacts them to um, access text. And then also that a read aloud accommodation is gonna be most appropriate for students who really access a lot of their content through an auditor, auditory mode. Um, the read aloud accommodation, it can be used online with the text to speech disabled, and it can be used on the paper version of the test. Of course, if you have a read aloud with an examiner, it's gonna give you the flexibility to have greater, greater flexibility for speed and pace, and also the volume of the test items being read. But it's important that if you're using the read aloud accommodation to make sure that as you're reading the test items, that those items are being read exactly as they're written, and you're still using a natural tone and manner. You don't want any inflection in your voice that could lead the students to cluing or lead them to the direct answer to the item. And it's also important for the examiner or the teacher that's administering the test to understand what the test item is asking for, so that as you are providing the read aloud, administra uh, read -aloud um, accommodation, you do not clue the students by reading the test item in a specific way. The alternate representation of response options accommodation. This accommodation is basically allowing for the three answer options that you all were able to see earlier when Shelly was showing you the structure of the item to be able to allow for students to respond um, in a different way. And some of those examples include, and as you all know, your students, that they may need to use choice cards or they may need physical objects to answer um, for their answer choices. And our examples there are such as, you know, clocks or money. And that for those of you who use um, the PEC system, the picture exchange communication on a regular basis, it may be that is something, if that's a student's um, modality, for communication, that may be the better way for the student to respond to their test items using the picture exchange communication. But this is also something that would have to be documented in the student's um, IEP. And we are currently working out more guidance and we'll have additional guidance and information about this particular accommodation along with even the other individual accommodations that I've shared in the VAP test implementation manual. So with the test conditions that I have shared with you, as well as with the individual accommodations, the line in the sand is that the testing conditions do not have to be documented in the IEP and the accommodations do. Now, some of you have already um, done your IEPs and are working off your new, new IEPs for this school year. If by chance some of those testing conditions that I spoke of are documented in your student's IEP as an accommodation, that is okay. You don't need to go back and do IEP addendums to change that back to a condition. It's just what it is. It's available to all students. You don't have to make a change there. Um, that was one of the reasons also to kind of help school divisions in making those testing conditions, which were some accommodations testing conditions so that you wouldn't have to go back and make a lot of changes and a lot of addendums to the IEPs and that you will be able to use, you know, look at those sample items. And also when the practice items um, are available, you'll be able to use those practice items with your students to see which conditions are gonna be best for the student to use and how they're responding to those items based on those conditions. So the hope is that with the testing conditions, it would allow you all to have more flexibility 
along with the embedded supports in test math, along with the supports that are already embedded in some of the items to really give your students the opportunity to maximize all of that flexibility and really demonstrate what they know based on the items and what they're asking of the students. So that's all I have as far as test conditions and um, individual um, accommodations. Again, more information to come in the VAT test implementation manual. And at this time, I'm going to over to uh, Dr. Sharon Seiler and she is going to share with you about some students that are participating in the VAP. Dr. Seiler. Great, thank you so much, Leah. Are you able to hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well, uh, good evening, every, everyone. I'm Sharon Seiler and delighted to join my uh, colleagues from assessment uh, this evening as we share with you um, about the new VAMP, what the test looks like. And um, up to this point, you've heard a lot of information about the structure of the items and the embedded supports that are in that structure. You've heard about uh, test nav for students who may be taking the online version of the test, but keeping in mind that the, a paper version is also available to students. But you've heard about test nav and its supports from Kevin. And then uh, Leah shared about the conditions and um, accommodations available for the new VAP to uh, support students and give them the opportunity to demonstrate what they know. And having been a former teacher of students in this population, I'm pretty sure at this point, uh, you have heard the information really through the lens of the students that you are currently teaching. So my goal in this presentation is to look at what we've been, um, what's been presented um, so far through the lens of actual students. So I'll be presenting about uh, three students, Matthew, a fifth grader, Corey, a seventh grader, and Lucy, a high school student. And as I think about these students, um, it really brings to mind um, students that were actually in my classroom and hopefully some of the characteristics and needs of these students will also um, help you to think about your students participating in the VAP and how the supports that we've talked about are going to help your students demonstrate what they, what they know. So let's go, Leah, to our first slide and our first student who is Matthew. And Matthew is a fifth grade student. Now what you see on the left-hand side of your screen is just a brief profile of Matthew and, 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 and where we have a bulleted list of some of his needs and then on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see um, what Matthew might need to participate in the new VAP. But let's start as we will with all of our students uh, in the classroom with their learner needs and um, actually their strengths and some of um, the issues that they bring to the learning setting. So when we look at Matthew's profile, we see that Matthew does have academic skills. He can, um, he can read and write some sight words. He has some basic math skills. He uses a calculator, concrete objects. Matthew does use verbal language, but we also see that there are issues of um, his focus and also issues of uh, fatigue. Uh, because of some seizures. And we also see that there are issues with his visual spatial understanding, left to right and fitting numbers into spaces. So when we consider a student like Matthew, for Matthew to participate 
in the new VAP, Matthew, like probably 99, if not 100% of the students uh, taking the new VAP, Matthew is going to need an individual administration of the test. We also think that Matthew can probably do an online, the online version. And he's going to be able to be supported in the online version on test nav using the text to speech feature. But he's going to probably need, because he is easily distracted, some of that information repeated. And so the test nav feature allows that to happen for Matthew. He uses in the classroom a talking calculator. And so because that's used in classroom instruction, Matthew can use his talking calculator on the new VAP test. Man, um, manipulatives were used in instruction. So again, that part of his profile is going to translate to what he needs for the test and multiple test sessions and planned breaks. So one of your questions at this point might be, how do I get from um, this, my students needs, um, his classroom instruction to uh, giving him what he needs to show what he knows on the, on the um, VAP test. So with that thought, let's go to the next, um, the next slide, Leah. So <clears throat> in terms of how we get here, well, first of all, as a fifth grader, we know that Matthew is actually going to be taking three tests, all three tests, because for fifth grade students without special needs, they participate in the um, reading, math, and science tests. And so the same would be true for Matthew in the new VAP. As a fifth grader, Matthew's going to need to take uh, the grade five reading, grade five mathematics, and grade five science test. Now, his teacher already has uh, quite a bit of information about Matthew's learner characteristics and his needs. Uh, if she were, um, if she was like me, um, I taught in a um, small school division in uh, Virginia. And because I was the only SD teacher, my students um, often stayed with me for several years. So um, like this teacher, uh, I would have had, if I were Matthew's teacher, quite a bit of information on Matthew's learner characteristics and Matthew's needs. But to add to what um, uh, his teacher already knows about Matthew, she lets Matthew practice with the VAT practice items for his grade level. So there are going to be, and I believe that Kevin um, mentioned this in his presentation, the sample items are for um, educator and parent use, but we're also going to have practice items that are um, items um, um, that are organized by grade level and, and by content area. So Matthew would be able to do some practice items for reading, some practice items for grade five mathematics and grade five science. So she begins with the online test <clears throat> uh, in test nav. And what she observes uh, through his pr uh, participation with the practice items is that Matthew enjoys the computer and he seems to be engaged across all of the items. Um, she also observes that uh, the text to speech function really supports Matthew's basic reading skills. Because remember, he does have some basic academic skills. But she also notices that she has to have the computer, that text-to-speech uh, feature, repeat uh, portions, of the, of, um, portions of the items for, for Matthew. So she knows that she can engage that feature for him. She also observes that he is visibly fatigued after three or four items. But once Matthew has a break of 10 or 15 minutes, he seems ready to do more. Uh, after the first couple of items, um, when, when those first few were presented to him, 
Matthew uh, used the mouse to indicate his answer choices. But as they went further into some of the practice items, um, his teachers uh, noted that Matthew seemed to be more comfortable verbalizing his answers and having her enter his answer choices. And that is certainly um, one of the things that is al allowable on the VAP te test where the student doesn't have to uh, enter uh, items on the computer themselves, the examiner can certainly do that. And uh, the practice item showed uh, to Matthew's teacher that he really needed to have su her support in entering his answer choices. And then um, he also used his ta uh, talking calculator and math tiles for the practice items involving uh, computation. And that was really to be expected because he uses both regular, regularly in his classroom, classroom assignments. So based on what the teacher uh, knew of Matthew as a student and what she saw with his practice, practice items, she was able to gather some very good information to go forward to um, uh, the, next, the next step. So Leah, if we could go to the next slide. So the um, IEP team uh, had determined uh, prior to uh, this that Matthew was eligible to um, participate in the grade five VAP test. And the IEP team, when they convened, they determined that individual test accommodations, those accommodations that Leah talked about were really not needed for Matthew to participate, that the test conditions would really meet all of his needs. And so those test conditions for Matthew are gonna be the um, um, manipulatives, uh, verbal prompts, uh, multiple test sessions because he needs a break, those planned breaks, all of those are test conditions available to all students. So the test conditions, that long list is really gonna help Matthew demonstrate what he knows. So let's, let's go on to a middle school, our middle school student, Leah, who is, who is Corey. And uh, Corey has a very different learner profile than Matthew. And we all know as teachers that all of our teachers, uh, all of our students, what they, what, what they bring in terms of their uh, needs, uh, it's very diverse. So, and when we look at Corey's student profile, we see that he does identify familiar pictures and symbols. He does have um, a sight word vocabulary. It's pretty limited. It's, it's around 35 words. But when he's read a passage, he can answer basic recall questions, particularly if the passage is short. Um, uh, what's what's um, really important um, for Corey is that he does exhibit some repetitive behaviors uh, that sometimes uh, gets in the way of his instruction in the classroom. And um, Corey does have some uh, computer skills. He can use a computer mouse and he can type when he's given a model. So in Corey's case, um, what he might need to participate in the new VAP, uh, right off the bat, we know the individual administration of the test. Again, that's gonna be uh, probably for all of your students. And Corey, is a little bit different um, than um, we see a difference in terms of uh, what he needs on, on the test in terms of the format. His teacher decides that he can do the online format in test nav with text to speech for the reading test, but he needs the paper version for the math test. And I'm gonna explain on the next slide how his teacher comes, uh, comes, uh, comes to that. Um, um, decision or that uh, recommendation for him. Um, uh, because of his repetitive behaviors, um, 
the teacher thinks that some of the verbal and, vi and visual prompts that are used to help focus Matthew's attention along with that, um, and that's really a part of, it's a part of the overall uh, behavioral system for Matthew, uh, which includes a visual schedule and a timer, um, which shows, which indicates a period of time that he, that he will work on a set of uh, test items. And then, um, so, and, and also in the testing envir environment, the incorporation of the strategies that have been used in instruction for self-regulation of some of the uh, repetitive behaviors. Um, so let's, let's go to the next um, slide for Corey. So we can see how we got to uh, addressing some of his needs in the way that, that I've described here. Well, first of all, uh, Corey is a seventh grader. So as a seventh grader, uh, Corey's going to participate in two tests. Again, because students with, without uh, disabilities in the general education test, the SOL test, uh, seventh graders take uh, two tests. And uh, so in Corey's case, he's gonna be taking grade seven reading and grade seven mathematics. But Corey is a transfer student from another school division. So his teacher, uh, unlike Matthew's teacher, doesn't really have that, that vast fund of knowledge um, about uh, Corey's needs because his teacher, Corey's teacher is just getting to know him. So uh, she goes a different route. She reviews his records. She looks at his current IEP. Um, she gathers information from her classroom assistant, uh, from the speech therapist, and even Corey's parents. Everybody is, is giving a piece of, uh, uh, or, or some information to help the teacher uh, better determine what Corey's needs are. So using their input and her own observation, she determines that Corey's reading, we know that he had, does have some reading skills, and his computer skills, they both together suggest that the online reading test really is a, um, the best version for Corey to demonstrate his reading knowledge. And again, with the online tests and test nav, he's going to have access to text text to speech. Um, the school staff and parents, so at home and at school, uh, Corey is using a reward chart and verbal and visual prompts, uh, as well as that visual schedule to help him focus attention and regulate um, some of his be behaviors. And since these strategies are really showing success, his teacher knows that that they need to be incorporated into the testing environment for Corey. Um, as, as a part of that overall system, Corey uh, uses a timer, which I mentioned earlier. And that timer determines uh, how long Corey will work um, before he gets a break. So the teacher is going to use that timer uh, to let her know um, how long or how many items uh, Corey can do and where his breaks are going to um, be. And of course, because of that, uh, Corey's going to need multiple test sessions. Um, and, but when we go back to his sight word vocabulary, his teacher um, decides that uh, because he is really focuses on symbols that it may be helpful for him uh, for her to highlight the symbols on the math test, uh, symbols like plus or, um, um, or um, addition, subtraction, equals to the dollar sign to highlight those symbols to help him focus. So that's why she decides that the paper version is going to be the best um, um, uh, way for him to demonstrate his math knowledge because the paper version is going to allow that testing condition of her highlighting those symbols. Um, but with the paper version, uh, he has access, of course, to her reading the math items. 
because we know in the VAP test that all of the items, whether the student is taking it online or taking the paper version, that um, the student is, the items are to be read to the student. So she's gonna read the math items aloud uh, to Corey as directed by the examiner uh, copy of the test. So when we go to the next slide, she's got this uh, information uh, based on Corey's needs and what she's determined. Uh, so given this information, uh, she determines, as I've said, that he's gonna take the paper math test and the uh, online reading test. And she shares her observations with the IEP team. The IEP team uh, does reconvene and they uh, decided that Corey's needs could be met uh, through the testing conditions and accommodations are not needed for Corey. And of course, the testing conditions are available to all VAP participants. So the, the verbal prompts, the breaks, the multiple test sessions, the highlighting, uh, all, of, all of that can be uh, available to Corey. So he's ready to test. And now we're just gonna go uh, to our final student who is Lucy. And Lucy is a high school student. And Lucy really has a um, variety of physical and sensory needs. Uh, she uses a, wheel, a wheelchair um, for mobility. She has some uh, um, uh, issues with her, her her upper extremities, her right and left hand. Uh, she uses yes, no response and some single words, uh, five to 10 single words. Um, and those are incorporated into an augmentative communication device for her to, so that Lucy can uh, communicate her basic needs, comments and choices. Uh, but Lucy also has some uh, vision and some hearing problems that need to be addressed uh, when, when it's uh, decided um, how Lucy can participate in the test. So for Lucy and individual administration, she's also going to um, have a paper copy of the test because um, she needs it magnified to increase for visibility, but she also needs uh, that paper test positioned on her slant board so she can get the best use of her of her um, right hand. In terms of her auditory uh, hearing needs, the items are going to be read by the teacher, but she's going to use an, an FM uh, system attached to her personal hearing aids. And of course, we know that um, her augmentative uh, system is going to be very important for her to uh, indicate what her answer choices are and multiple test sessions. So let's take a look at using the next slide, Leah, how we, how we got to this um, bulleted list for Lucy. Well, first of all, it's important to note that in Lucy's school division, um, the school division that she's enrolled in, they use uh, flexibility for the high school BAP test. And that, that high school uh, flexibility allows the content area areas to be assessed across the high school grades in grades 9, 10, and, um, and um, 11. And in a ninth, as a ninth grader in Lucy's school division, she's only required to participate in the VAP high school science test. She's going to take the reading test in her 10th grade year and the math test in her 11th grade year. And her teacher knows that Lucy is really interested in science, what she's seen in the classroom. She enjoys uh, participating in, in experiments, in science projects. And um, after working with Lucy in the classroom uh, for several months, she's been, been able to incorporate some information on Lucy's um, uh, uh, communication board. Um, from those lessons. And Lucy's excited and her parents um, have, have really also shared how much Lucy enjoys her science class and the science instruction. So uh, for Lucy, if we go to uh, the next slide, 
Leah. Uh, from what the teacher has determined and seen so far with Lucy is that the paper format is going to be best for Lucy because of several reasons. First of all, uh, the paper format can be uh, enlarged um, more, more than uh, test nav can do. So uh, she's going to be able to enlarge the, um, the test and the answer choices. She's also going to be able to position them, find the optimal position uh, for Lucy uh, using the slant board so that she can also um, see the items and use her right hand to the greatest extent possible. Uh, the amplification system um, that's been helpful um, in her classroom instruction is also gonna be helpful uh, on the test again, as the items are read to Lucy. Uh, Lucy does uh, have a yes, no response. She has a yes, no switch and um, choice cards are gonna be um, something, um, a, an accommodation that uh, the teacher can use using the paper format of the test and that will allow her to communicate what she knows in science. And uh, multiple sessions are also gonna be needed because using her communication device, the yes, no switch and the choice cards, that's likely gonna mean that it's gonna take a few minutes for Lucy uh, to respond to each item. So the teacher decides that yes, this test is going to um, have to be uh, um, administered to you, to Lucy over multiple test sessions. So when her teacher goes to the, um, takes her observations and uh, to the IEP team, we get to the next slide. And uh, given that information, um, um, the teacher uh, requests that the IP, EP, IEP team uh, reconvene. Um, she's going to be taking the pa paper test, but she wants uh, the IEP team to consider adding the accommodation of alternate, re alternate representation response options to allow for the use of choice cards with Lucy. So the IEP team uh, taking the teacher's information, they, they decided that um, that accommodation, which allowed for the choice cards work, would absolutely be necessary for Lucy. Also, um, the slant board, the magnification, the amplification, the multiple test sessions, uh, even the augmentative device, those are all testing conditions um, that are available to all students and don't really need to be documented on the IEP. The, what needs to be documented, of course, is that accommodation, uh, which allows for the use of the choice cards. But even though testing conditions don't have to be documented in Lucy's IEP, the teacher um, decides to use the opportunity of the IEP team uh, convening to discuss them uh, with her parents so that the parents see uh, and understand that Lucy's needs are being fully, fully, a, fully addressed. So I think, um, Leah, that, that I'm going to um, ask uh, my colleague from special education, uh, now that I've finished this section, Deborah Johnson, if she would share um, some resources that can really assist uh, teachers um, with, with some of the items that I've talked about and some of the assistive uh, technology, learning more about that. So Deborah, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. And I just want to quickly share with you, because I know our time is getting very close to the end here, but I uh, just want to share some resources with you. Um, I want to emphasize uh, TTAC online um, and uh, hope that you guys, uh, if you don't already know your local T, your regional TTAC, that you will get to know them. Um, we have uh, TTACs, as you can see on this chart here, uh, for each one of these different regions. Um, 
So if you're in Region 4, George Mason University will be your uh, TTAC, uh, regional TTAC that you can go to. Uh, anyway, these guys have worked really hard on creating some resources for you guys uh, to help you uh, as you uh, go through with uh, uh, administering the VAP to your students. Leah, can you go to the next slide? Uh, they have their latest uh, resources that they have developed for you guys are some resources for student participation. Um, and these are just a list of a few of them on here. These are all links to these, um, the description is over here. Um, but they are, they are some wonderful resources to help you as um, you are um, learning more about your students and how they're gonna pr actually participate uh, in this alternate assessment. Leah? Again, these are just more of the resources that they have, um, that they've put together for you. And it is currently posted on TTAC online. Uh, and Leah, I think you've got the next one. Yes, here is the, uh, down at the bottom of, of the screen there, you will see where you can find these uh, resources that they have just recently put up. Uh, and like I said, this is just a short list of them, and I, but I wanted you to be aware that they have uh, put these resources up. Uh, they have also uh, have uh, resources up there for the VSALs, uh, instructional resources, as well as um, there are resources up there too for the um, uh, writing and uh, history, which I know some people haven't really asked a whole lot about that tonight, um, but I did put in the chat where you can find um, the uh, superintendent's memo, uh, the link to that where uh, information about the, uh, ASO, the ASOLs and the uh, writing and um, history components of the VAP. And hopefully I didn't confuse anybody. Next one. Thank you, Leah. I think Shelly is coming on again to. And I'm sorry, folks, I can't seem to get my camera to work, um, but I am here. <laughs> So um, we've certainly provided you with a great deal of information tonight, and we very much appreciate your attention and all the great questions you've put in the Q&A. I know in some cases we didn't have an immediate answer for your question, but please know we will be providing you with, with more guidance as time passes, and we'll also have that module three presentation that we talked about. I know that I'm standing between you and the rest of your evening, so let me do this as quickly as possible. But I know many of you are interested in what the VAP test overall is going to look like. So we've talked a lot about the items, but let's talk a bit about the test. Next slide, Leah. So there will be 35 items on each VAP test, 30 operational items. Those are the ones that count towards the student's score and then five field test items that we are being, they're, they're being tried out with students for future use. The test is organized so that the easiest items are presented first, and then they're followed by more challenging items. And the reason we're doing this is to try to provide maximum access for students so that there will be easiest item, the easiest items in the beginning of the test. As we said in, during the session, the test can be administered over multiple days, and you can determine how many items are um, administered in each sitting. So, you know, again, maximum flexibility for getting students uh, uh, to the items. Next slide, Leah. Despite the fact that we are providing you with lots of flexibility to administer the test in multiple test sessions and the way that the test is organized from easier to more difficult, um, we know that there will be some students who just can't get through all of the items. And so we are providing you guidance here about what is called discontinuing testing. 
So if you, as the examiner, determine that the student just can't go any further, you can discontinue testing. Um, if you, it's in their best interest to stop, you know, they just can't do any more. Um, if a student uh, gets to at least five items, they will be considered a participant in the test for the purpose of federal accountability. But you know, you should be aware that discontinuing testing, you know, will impact their score on the test because, of course, they're they're not going to um, have an opportunity to respond to the the questions that would occur after you have decided to discontinue. But that is an option and we'll provide more information about uh, the process for this in, in module three. Next slide, Liam. We also wanted to provide you with some information about the, the test blueprints. Uh, for those of you who administer the SOL test, you know that each test has a blueprint. It's like a guide for test construction, or I sometimes think of it as a recipe. So it provides information about the content areas that will be addressed and also the number of items by content area. And we'll provide the blueprints uh, fairly soon on the VAP webpage that we talked about in the beginning of the presentation. The next slide provides a little more information about the, the test blueprints. This is just an example of what one looks like. This is the one for grade three math. You can see that on the left-hand side, there are reporting categories, which is really um, you know, uh, groups of, of, of uh, common uh, topics. Then the essential, the VSOLs that are measured in that particular reporting category, and then the total number of items. So there'll be a blueprint for each content area and grade level. Next slide, Liam. You've also, there have also been a number of questions in the Q&A about you know, the test window. So the testing window will open on February the 28th and it will go through the last Friday in June, which is June the 24th. So it is a, a fairly wide window and you may administer VAP during the statewide window according to your division's testing schedule. So your school division will have an individual testing schedule, but this does give you an idea of, of when testing will begin. It's much earlier than SOL testing for the spring. And then Leah, I think we're gonna talk about a few frequently asked questions. Um, these are just a couple of questions that we have gotten very often. So we wanted to make sure we provided you with the answers. So I think the first one is about levels of performance. So remember in the old VAP, um, you uh, chose the level of performance. That is not the case with the new VAP. Um, as we mentioned, instead, the, the test is really constructed. So it starts with easier items and the, the difficulty of the items gradually increases. <clears throat> Next slide. And then another question we get frequently is, can teachers still choose the standards that, that are going to be used for the VAP assessment? And, as we mentioned earlier, um, teachers do not select the VSOL that's going to be assessed. Um, you do need to, to teach um, all of the stand, all the VSOLs across the content areas because you know, it, it's possible that an item uh, measuring any of those VSOLs uh, could appear on the test. And then I think our last slide, oops, what needs to be documented in the student's IEP? We've certainly got a lot of questions about this. Um, just as a reminder, we talked a great deal about all of the supports that are available within the items and as part of the testing conditions. Uh, those do not have to be documented in the IEP. Um, testing accommodations, and as uh, Leah mentioned, there are really only four, um, do have to be documented in the IEP. That's Braille, read aloud on all test items. Remember that the majority of uh, items are read aloud to all students, even those who do not have the read aloud accommodation, and then the, the alternate representation of the response options. <clears throat> and uh, Leah, I think our last uh, slide really asked for additional questions, but I don't know that we have time for any. I will see if there are any burning questions that staff are seeing in the Q&A. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. So um, 
Once again, thank you all very much for your attention tonight. We know that this was a late night for many of you and we very much appreciate your participation. Um, please do join us for uh, module three uh, sometime later this fall and let us know if there is other assistance that you need in the meantime. We thank you very much for all you do every day for the students of Virginia and I hope you have a pleasant evening. Thank you.